Several years ago, I went out to Oakland, California for an intensive in spirituality. It was my first trip to Oakland, and I was a frail and timid 42-year-old. On Monday morning, I got up of that week in time to get a cup of coffee down the street from the YMCA in Berkeley where I was staying. Pete's was right up the street. The barista at Pete's asked me if I wanted my coffee with room. <laughs> and I said, this a little early for room in my coffee, isn't it? And she said, room. And I said, room? Room for what? And she said, half and half? Sugar? Cream? Well, I drank my coffee black. And so I, of course, declined uh, room in my coffee cup for something besides coffee. And uh, little did I know that I actually wanted more room in my coffee cup because West Coast coffee, you don't drink black unless you have a cast iron stomach and a titanium <laughs> taste bud set. I just didn't know I needed more room in my coffee. Reminded me, this anthem that we did in this very room, Jesus, being in this very room for all of us, room, enough love for all of us. I was thinking about room in my coffee. <laughs> I was also thinking, though, about my, my mom always being willing like Liddell's grandmother at a family cookout to make more room when guests showed up, or strangers for that matter. Even in the car on the way to church on Wednesday evenings as well as on Sunday morning, we would pile three or four other kids into the car with us, three youngest kids and my mom, to get them to church because maybe their parents worked during that time or something. We always slid over and made more room. My mom, as you know, and as I've said before, um, would often take in traveling sales, it was men at the time in, in that era, in the summertime. <clears throat> we'll make room for you, she would say. Now, I have to say, having them in our house was one thing. Having them around the dining room table where there was space for me to you know, get away and hide if I needed to, well, was okay. But I needed my private space. And my room upstairs, the boys' room, was occupied by my two, old, two of my older brothers and myself. <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of room for more people. There were four of us when my oldest brother came home from college. Now there were only three beds. So I was the youngest <clears throat> and also the littlest. And so you know what happened there. <clears throat> I got displaced. I was the youngest and the littlest and often what is the youngest and the littlest have to take what over, whatever is left over room as well as goods and services. <clears throat> Put another complete stranger into the room and I was ready to leave home at seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to let a stranger into your space, your sacred space, your private space. Space, whether that space is represented by your bedroom or your church or even your community or maybe just your mind or your heart. The space, those spaces seem to shrink whenever a stranger comes in like the way it is whenever you may be talking with a group of friends in sort of a private conversation and someone comes in you don't know that someone else in the group may know 
and the conversation just sort of slows down and stops and there's this awkward orientation moment for the newcomer. Sometimes there isn't room for others. Solomon, in the story that Maxine read from uh, the book of Kings, 1 Kings, Solomon tries to build a house big enough for who? For God, yeah. Solomon builds a temple, right? This elaborate, magnificent, massive temple, big enough for God, he hopes. And yet God's presence is, is so much greater and more than Solomon could imagine it to be. And immediately the whole the whole space is filled with the smoke of God's presence. The whole entire world cannot contain you. Solomon is drawn to confess in God's presence. God's self, God's soul, who God is, God's presence oozes out of the boundaries that we set for it. And Solomon to his credit, recognizes that this room, this temple, big as it is, isn't big enough for God's presence. Realizes, Solomon does, that even this community of Israel, this people of Israel, isn't big enough to contain God's presence. He realizes that not even the whole world, not even heaven and earth, can contain God's presence. Nor can any of the spaces that we create contain and hold and keep in God's presence. <clears throat> My mother ran into a similar sort of problem. And I love my mother. I love that she picked up extra kids on the way to church every week that I remember going to church as a child. I love that she invited in traveling salesmen. And yet, she could find room only for the people who look like us, close, close, close enough like us, right? I mean, like, you know, Maybe, maybe fair-skinned redheads were okay, Nico. But beyond that, it was, uh, you know, people, people had to look like us. She had not counted, like Solomon, like many of us, on God being bigger than her imagined way of seeing God. And like Solomon was initially, like I was in my childhood, like I was for a long time in my adult life. <clears throat> now here's the thing about not being able to see the larger presence of God than, 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 than what we have in our mind or in our eyes. If we can't see it, we, we may be only able to see God in people like us. We may be only able to see God in our own sort of subgroup, in our own nation, in our own religion. We, we may be able to see God only in that way. And I'm going to tell you, that's okay. I know you might be surprised to hear me say that. But that's okay, and here's why. If, if we can only see God this way, one way, and can't see God bigger than that, that's okay. You know why? Because Jesus came to bring recovery of sight to those who cannot see God bigger than their imagination. So if you find yourself there, just know it's okay. 
But also know Jesus is trying to open your eyes to see God in the same way, same way God did with Solomon. In a very dramatic way, God says to Solomon, Solomon, I know you got this idea of who I am. I know you have this vision and you've implemented it well with this elaborate temple, but it won't hold who I am. I take, I find great hope in Jesus coming to bring recovery of sight to those of us with limited vision about who God is. It's easy, you see, to make room for God when God looks like us, talks like us, speaks our language. But what about when God looks poor or transgender or brown or black or Hindu or Muslim? What about when God wears a turban or when God's only language is Spanish? Dare we unlock the doors where God sits encaged as a child at our borders or as a mother separated from that child miles away. Dare we go after that God who's been sold into human slavery at our border. Dare we hunt that God down to find God and reunite that God with their family? Dare we find the God in our prisons? And dare we make room for the God who immigrates to our country? Solomon gets it. He makes more room for God in his mind and in his heart, which is where that has to happen. He says, God, don't just hear my prayer. Did you notice that in this passage of Scripture? That was the most beautiful part of this passage of Scripture. He says, God, don't just hear my prayer or the prayers of my people. He says, hear the prayer of the stranger who comes into our land. Here in heaven and do all that the foreigner calls to you so they may also know God is in this room. And it is big enough for all. Friends, we have the wisdom of Solomon available to us. We form it as the gospel of Jesus Christ, love for all people. We have that wisdom available to us and we exercise it when we're able to see that God will not be contained by our limited vision of who God is. So when you have to make more room for God, whether it's in your house or your church or your community or your nation, your country, or your coffee. <laughs> when you have to make more room, recognize that you must make more room for none other than God who will not be contained by our human borders. And let that be okay. Just let it 